This is Project Lasagna, where everything, except for the grana podana, is made from scratch. Part 1. Bolognese de Ragu. Typically, you start out with a sofrito, then you put in your pancetta, and then you follow that up with your meat. I change that order up because it's all about fawn development with this, and that's the key. So I actually start out with a pancetta, and in this case, for the large batch I'm making, it's 400 grams of slightly minced pancetta. And I brown that up slowly over a low to medium low heat. I'm not looking to crisp it immediately. I want to render out as much fat as I possibly can. Over a course of 10 or 15 minutes on low heat, I will keep stirring that around. And as you can see, it slowly renders the fat out. And just as it's starting to brown and crispy, and it's developed a beautiful fond, I'm gonna remove it. And I remove all of the pancetta fat, except for about a tablespoon or two. And here's the key. I add my beef in, in small portions, broken up into small pieces. That way the surface area of the nice hot pan will cook the meat, causing it to release its water quickly. And because there's space around all of these, the water will start evaporating much, much, much quicker than it would be if you dumped all the meat in at once. Maybe 200 grams to 300 grams per portion. I've got a nice big pot, so that gives me a lot of surface area. And you can see where a little bit of the water is, uh, is being shed. It's not forming a little pool for the meat to boil in. At this point, because I had a nice bacon fond, and there's no way that bacon fond is gonna last all the way through the cooking without probably burning a little, I hit this with a tiny bit of white wine, maybe about a, an eighth of a cup, quarter of a cup of wine, just to remove that fond from the bottom and cook that till it was completely evaporated and started forming yet another fond. At that point, when the second fawn started to form, I'm adding in some more beef, about another 200 to 300 grams. And again, in small pieces, you can see me tearing it up as I'm doing it here. But basically what happens here is the cool meat cools down the cooking process of the already cooked meat, whereas the heat from both the pan and the already cooked beef warms the other stuff up, causing it to shed its fluid much quicker. So the water comes out, but because there's not a ton of it, it evaporates really quickly. And then I'm adding my third batch of meat. Small pieces, torn up, and as mentioned, between two and 300 grams, give or take. It doesn't have to be exact. You just don't want to crowd the pan with too much uncooked meat. And there we go, we stir it in. As you can see, it doesn't really get swimming in water and it just starts browning and developing that fond really quickly. You can see it starting to build up here. already and we're uh, going into our fourth batch and this is about halfway because in this particular one we did eight batches before the meat was all in there so again a few little pieces and once we hit about 300 grams or so 250 ish start stirring it again and again and you can see that fawn developing on the bottom oh all that caramelizing beefy goodness and once that's fully cooked, you add the fifth batch. Because, you know, can't go wrong with a lot of batches. And at this point, this meat is so close to actually getting that sort of brown caramelization, the crispiness on the veal. We don't quite want to get, so that's why this meat cools it down again. Sort of rests the cooking process for a minute or two, allowing for the shedding of the water. Well, I know you're getting really tired of me saying that. And then we stir it in again. Now, the one nice thing is the water shedding actually helps lift a little bit of the fond up. So it's not just concentrating, concentrating and building a big thick layer on the bottom. It forms one, then a little bit of it comes off and more forms and a little bit of it comes off each time you add some, a new batch of meat. It cooks really quickly when you add the fresh meat because of the residual heat of both the pan and the already cooked meat. And again, you can see a little bit of the fond lifting up, but a lot of it stays, but none of it is burning. And at this point, I've probably been cooking for about 20 minutes or so. And here we go. Yes, and the sixth batch of meat. <laughs> we do add a lot of batches. The nice part about this, and this is key, doesn't matter what ragu you're making, if you want to make it better, do this process instead of throwing all your meat in at once. 
any ingredients that you have for a ragu or a spaghetti sauce or anything, you will get more caramelization on the meat, less boiling, better quality, a lot more flavor. And there we go, that's the seventh batch going in. And more stirring. And you're breaking up those larger pieces into smaller ones. And again, you can see the fawn underneath. And each time you add some fresh meat, it gets lifted up a tiny bit and then builds again. And the nice part is that fawn keeps getting folded back into the meat, folded back into the meat. So all of the meat is just, it has all this caramelization goodness going on in there. That's looking awesome. Stir it constantly during these stages. I mean, I leave it for a minute or two. So I lied. Turns out there's nine batches of meat going on. <laughs> you can even see the fawn developing up on the sides too. And don't worry, all of that's going to come out. And there, as you can see that, once the last batch gets in and we browned it up, stirring constantly. This wooden flat utensil is perfect for scraping fond up from the bottom. And there you can see, after cooking that for quite a while and browning it, look at that gorgeous fond. And we're going to add the bacon back in at this point. We want to lift that fond up before too much else happens to it, so we're going to add almost the rest of the white wine. Saving a little bit because we may have to do this again. So we're going to use that wine to lift the fond up yet again. And uh, yeah, probably need a little tiny bit more in there. And as you can see, it's... Uh, oh, and I forgot a little tiny bit of the bacon. Add that in and we're just going to evaporate all of that wine. And remove all of the fond, and we've got oh, a little scrapey scrape there. <laughs> and we're just going to let that go for a tiny bit. And then we're going to remove the meat from the, from the pot. And then we're going to add the, our sofrito in, which is, of course, carrots, celery, and onion. And immediately it's going to shed a lot of liquid, and that's going to pick up even more of the fond, remove it from the bottom of the pan. And basically we want to cook this for about 10 to 13 minutes till it gets soft and translucent, it loses a fair bit of moisture, and it's kind of dry, and even starts forming a tiny bit of fond on its own. Then we're going to add the beef back in with the bacon, and we're going to mix this thoroughly, and we're going to caramelize this a tiny bit too, because we want more fond. It's all about the fond. Yeah, just building as much flavor into this meat dish as possible. Because we're not using any spices, a lot of the flavor comes from what we're doing to the meat and the sofrito and the pancetta. I know I said bacon, but pancetta is Italian bacon to me. <laughs> Delicious. So there we have it. Everything's together, forming yet another bit of a fond. I think this is what now the fifth fond we formed. And there we go. Look at that. Now we're gonna add a liter of beef stock. Oh, adding, actually, that's the last of the wine, sorry. And we're going to add the last of the wine there. Pick up that last little bit of fond and evaporate this off. Basically, I'm trying to get as much of that browny, caramely goodness back into the meat mixture as I can. And then, going to add a liter of beef stock. Let's thoroughly incorporate that. The next ingredient, milk, another liter of milk. And it's really nice too, because the, uh, some of the uh, enzymes in the milk actually help tenderize the meat. And adds a tiny bit of lactose sweetness to it as well. I mean, not that at any point it becomes sweet, but that helps with the acidity of the tomatoes as well. And of course, at this point, adding two 23 ounce cans of San whole San Marzano tomatoes. And I've already taken the liberty of crushing those tomatoes by hand in a pot so I can just dump this in. 
and then just gently stir it in because I have very little room between the edge of the pot and that. Probably about, as you can see, probably about half an inch, maybe. <laughs> and then we're just going to let this simmer. And I mean simmer. As the end result, I think uh, this simmered for about 12 hours. And there we go, partway through. You can see it thickening up into a kind of a beautiful meat porridge. It kind of clings to the flat utensil there quite nicely. It still has to reduce a tiny bit more. And as you can see, there's probably about an inch and a half down from the edge of the pot. And here we go. About two, two and a half inches down from the edge of the pot. Nice, thick meat porridge. And that's what a ragu bolognese should be like. <laughs> really should be meat porridge. And you'll note that it has a nice orange cast to it. It's not red at all. Because even though it has tomatoes in it, this is not a tomato sauce. This is a bolognese. It's a meat sauce. And that's what makes it delicious. I love these slow motion pours. And don't forget, like sub and subscribe to me. And make a comment. Tell me what you think of this recipe. Or my take on this recipe. Oh, that looks so glistening. Delicious orangey good. Here's the ingredients. And then we're on to part two. Fior de latte. Fresh mozzarella. The Fior de Latte Mozzarella. We're gonna start out with eight liters of milk. We're gonna put that in a double boiler. Bring that up to 32 degrees Celsius. Once we hit 32 degrees Celsius, I'm gonna take about one quarter of a teaspoon of thermophile type B. Add that in, just sprinkle it over the surface and let it hydrate for about five minutes and then give it a stir in. And then let that ripen for 60 minutes, periodically stirring and trying to maintain 32 degrees. Went a little high at 33. The pH is 6.4. I've got one eighth of a teaspoon of lapaze that I've hydrated for half an hour and I've stirred that in completely. Then added in 1.8 milliliters of calcium chloride in 60 ml distilled water and stirred that in as well. That adds a little soluble calcium back into the mix. Also in 60 mils of distilled water, 1.5 mils of double strength rennet. I'm going to stir that in vigorously, thoroughly for about 45 seconds to a minute tops and uh, vertical, horizontal, and then just let that set for 30 minutes. Do not stir it and try to maintain that 32 degrees. And we're going to test, got a nice little clean break there, looks good. We're going to cut the curd into one half inch square cubes roughly. That is approximate. Now, after we get this cut done, both the uh, horizontal first and then the vertical, just give them a little swing around. What we're going to do is give that a bit of a rest, about five minutes just to let the curd heal. And then do a second cut, and this we're just going to go back and forth and basically bring it into kernel-sized pieces, maybe pea-sized. And we're still around 32 degrees, and the pH is 6.3. Now we're going to heat the whole curd mass to 37 degrees Celsius over 30 minutes, and we're going to stir as we do this to prevent the curd from matting together. Now I've got a cheesecloth line strainer, pour the entirety of the way through, and there's the curd mass looking pretty good like rice sized at this point now of course it's sitting in its own way so I'm going to actually take some of the whey and put it aside I'm gonna keep two-thirds and use that to warm the curd mass during the uh, acidification but I'm gonna take a third of that put it in a separate pot and put that pot in the fridge I want to chill it down so it's nice and cold because instead of doing a water bath later I'm gonna do a whey bath much better on the balls of cheese So we're gonna cover it up and periodically heat up the whey to make sure it stays between 37 and 40 degrees Celsius. And now, as I said, we're gonna chill the whey in the fridge. We're also gonna take some of that extra whey and make some ice cube trays and freeze them up. And we're gonna have the time, because over the next few hours, we're just gonna maintain that temperature as best we can. And we're trying to get the acidity between 5.0 and 5.3 pH. 
and I'm checking every 60 to 90 minutes roughly and I'm getting about a 0.1 to 0.15 drop in 90 minutes but unexpectedly when I checked at, at six and a half hours it had already dropped plummeted from 5.75 to 5.1 and I realized I had to work on that curd mass pretty quickly before it dropped below 5.0 so I didn't get some filming done apologies for that anyway we hit 5.15 pH and I uh took the curd mass out and started heating the whey to 85 degrees celsius and I took that curd mass and cut it into roughly one inch pieces doesn't have to be fully exact but you just want some smaller pieces so they heat up nicely in that nice hot way there we go all chopped up we're going to put that into a pail or a bucket or a tray just so you can work it I've mixed it in with three grams of salt and then I'm going to add in 85 degrees celsius whey just to cover the curd get it nice and soft and then with some nice heavy duty gloves I'm going to massage and knead that curd into a single mass let the water warm it up and then just form one nice big mass and just keep kneading it and working it together and eventually you'll notice it forms one complete mass at that point you can fold it back on itself and start the stretching I keep doing this and remember to refresh the whey it'll cool down quite quickly so just keep splashing some more in there and if you have to at times return the uh, cheese mass to the original pot which is nice and hot anyway once you get that all stretched out shape it into balls in this case I got a five of them pretty nice yield of this I got to about uh, just shy of a kilogram of cheese just a little more than two pounds now here's my master I took that chilled whey and the whey cubes that's how I chilled the balls of cheese down. Oh, that's some good looking mozzarella. So I put it in containers of chilled whey, sealed it up, and then it's ready for use. Two of these went to the lasagna. Oh, it keeps getting better and better. Project lasagna. Good on ya. Focata. Ricotta's stunt double. Not a lot of ingredients. Four liters of milk, one liter of buttermilk, 60 milliliters of vinegar, and salt. Start off, pour the milk out, and start warming it up. The Bolognese Ragu is making a special guest appearance. Anyway, our target is 80 degrees Celsius, so we're going to take a medium low to low heat, start warming it up, and stir regularly. Really important to stir regularly. You don't want the milk to burn. You just don't. We're partway along, 46 and a half degrees Celsius. Again, our target is 80, and you'll see some bubbles starting to form here on the edge. That means you're getting pretty close. We might want to take another temperature read, and we've got 71 and a half we're going to hit here, which is pretty close. So at this point, I'm pretty much stirring the whole time. And you'll notice it's just starting to foam. And there we go, 80 degrees. Turn off the heat immediately. And we're going to add some buttermilk. Now, I add a cultured buttermilk, so the mesophilic culture will actually start to develop and put a little more flavor into this ricotta. Needs about 24 hours, 48 is ideal. And oh, yeah, I should have used a bigger jug. Anyway, stir that in for about 45 seconds. You can see the the lumpiness and then we're going to add 60 milliliters of vinegar as a coagulant and stir this vigorously side to side up and down i'm trying to do it very gently here uh, no more than 60 seconds and you can see it coagulating as it is we'll leave that for 15 minutes don't stir it and then we're just going to ladle that curd you know, i have a nice big one here and put it into a cheesecloth lined strainer Just let the whey drain off. What you want to do at the end is strain the whey again, get all the last little bits, and then you can reserve the whey for other uses. And there's a lot of other uses. So you're just going to let that curd drain for about 15 minutes. And then we're going to tie it off and hang it from a tap or 
anywhere that you can hang it really and have a bowl underneath it to the excess way. And I, uh, because I do mine over the sink, I put the strainer underneath it just in case it falls and I don't want my cheese all over my sink. Anyway, give that 45 minutes of hanging. At that point, we're going to dump it into a bowl and measure the yield because this will determine the amount of salt you're going to use. So we're going to weigh this off and miraculously 800 grams right on the nose. It usually takes 1% to 2% salt, but I'm adding in some other stuff, so I'm only going to go with straight 1% here, which happens to be 8 grams. And I'm adding sea truffle seaweed. It gives kind of a nice briny salinity and some truffle notes. Nice little umami boost to the ricotta. Let it mature for about 24 hours, 48 ideal, and a little more flavor will develop in it, and it's delicious. This is the Bechamel. Here's your ingredients. There will be a list at the end of the video for you to pause and write down. Grana Padano, pepper, butter, nutmeg, bay leaf and garlic, milk, flour, and salt. We're going to start off melting the butter. I do this over a low heat. Just take my time. I'm not in a big rush here. Give it a little stir. And then, once it's melted, add in 75 grams of flour. By the way, this is going to make about 750, 800 mils of bechamel as an approximation. I cook the uh, roux, the butter and the flour, for about three minutes. 
just to completely get rid of the flour taste, help make it as smooth as possible. There it is, it's just starting to foam up bubble. Not quite trying to brown it. Please throw me a like, subscribe. That'd be awesome. Oh, that looks pretty. And take all of the milk, pour it in and whisk continuously by pouring it in. This will help prevent the lumpiness and bumpies and do not stop during the addition of the milk at all. And I, even then after the milk's poured in, I'd probably stir it for another minute just to make sure there's nothing untoward that I'm not gonna like. Throw in a bay leaf. I did two cloves of garlic, cut it in two to increase the surface area. Added a tablespoon of nutmeg, gave that a quick little stir. Then I added a little salt and pepper to taste. And I always use freshly cracked black pepper. Then over a medium low heat, while stirring regularly, I just kept cooking this until it thickened into the desired consistency. So you're gonna see a little bit of stirring. And as it's getting close, test it on a spoon. You want it to actually kind of coat the back. Now it was just a tiny bit runny. Cooked it for another minute or two. And there we have it. I'm gonna turn off the heat. and run it through a fine mesh strainer. Gets rid of the, any of the larger pieces, the bay leaf, the garlic cloves, everything comes out at this point. Use the back of the spoon just to make sure I get all the excess inside the strainer out and just give a quick little scrape on the bottom and there we have it. Then we're gonna stir in the cheese after it's cooled down a tiny bit, but still nice and hot so that the cheese doesn't get stringy and clumpy incorporates quite nicely and there you go that's a beautiful looking bechamel or bechamel and then just chill it and then it's time to make the lasagna here's the ingredients by the way don't forget to like subscribe and follow thanks
<laughs> oh, that, that is amazing lasagna. It just melts in your mouth. The tenderness of the bolognese, all its flavors are coming through. We're getting the mozzarella, getting the ricotta, the bechamel, mm, and the pasta. It's like ribbons of heaven. Oh, gonna have some more of that. <laughs> That's a lasagna. It is so rich, so creamy. Oh my god. Mm. Oh, that bolognese. That stuff is delicious. Yum, 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 yum. Exactly what the lasagna should be. Mm. 